Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us um, on this uh, lockdown night around most of Australia. My name is Nick Tapper. I'm the associate publisher at Giramondo Publishing. We're the really proud publisher of Anwen Crawford's book, No Document, and I'm really pleased to be uh, presenting tonight uh, Anwen Crawford in, in conversation with uh, the wonderful critic Declan Fry. Um, I'm speaking to you from Sydney, from unceded Gadigal land, Eora Nation land, and um, I pay respects to elders past and present. Um, and I also wanted to just uh, say what a pleasure it is to have um, so many people in the room that we've, I think we've got about 100 people registered and I hope that we have a really, you know, we have a great uh, discussion. You'll see in the right hand side of your screen, there's an opportunity to put comments there if you wanted to comment on anything that comes up in the discussion. And also there's an ask a question box at the bottom if you want to, um, you know, put a question. Um, Declan will put some audience questions to Anwen at the end of the session, assuming that there are some uh, some good ones that, that come along through the course of the discussion. Um, I don't think I need to introduce Anwen, but we are, as I say, really proud um, to be publishing her book, No Document, um, which with its very shiny section, which is taken on the cover, which appears so well on screen here. Um, and because you're here for Anwen's event, I probably don't need to introduce you to her beyond saying that, you know, as we know, she is a wonderful uh, writer, critic and artist among many other things. And the book is really a testament to all of those skills that she has. And I'm uh, really proud that we've been able to publish such an unusual singular book that is, you know, really um, a marker of Anwen's intellect and her qualities as a thinker and her kind of capacity as an artist in all kinds of different dimensions. Um, I, it was really great when Anwen suggested that Declan and her have a conversation. Declan wrote one of the really kind of perspicacious and stunning reviews of the book. And so I feel like he will have many interesting things to say. He's also posted today on Twitter his annotations from, from the book. So I feel like he'll have uh, any number of, um, of in-depth kind of uh, an analyses to give. But um, to introduce Declan, who many of you will know anyway, Declan's a writer, he's a poet and an essayist. Uh, he was born in Wangatha country in Kalgoorlie. Um, in 2020, he was shortlisted for the Judith Wright Poetry Prize and awarded the 2021 Peter Blasey Fellowship for his Mianjin essay, Justice for Elijah, or a Spiritual Dialogue with Ziggy Ramo Dancing. And his work has appeared also in publications, including Australian Book Review, Liminal, The Monthly, Overland, and The Saturday Paper. Um, so I will leave you two to talk, and I'll come back at around 7.30 to wind up. Thank Go ahead, you. Thank you so much, Nick, for that introduction. Um, I am, hope I'm still moving. I've frozen for myself. Oh, and I've just, I've just lost you, Declan. I can't see you, <laughs> but I can hear you. I'm going to continue. Hopefully I come back. Uh, <laughs> you are, you're back. I'm back. <laughs> uh, this is a real pleasure. Um, I'm currently on uh, Wurundjeri country. I want to pay my respect to the elders here, past and present. And uh, I ask everyone in the audience just to consider their own relationship to the country that they're on, and what that means to them, how that um, affects their lives or doesn't. I, um, I remember and when, when I first read No Document, and I like that I remember that. There is a real magic about the fact that I mean, I don't remember the date because time has lost meaning in COVID, but I remember where I was. I was in the gym and the light was half diminishing. It was that kind of 4 p.m., 5 p.m. time. And I'd read about uh, five pages. So it was early days in the novel and already I had that. In the novel? In the novel? <laughs> Sorry, in the essay. But that's the, well, we'll talk about the novel and the essay. But I think I had the thrill of, you know, that kind of investment we often associate with the novel. Um, but true, your essay, if we had to categorize, I know you have a problem with categorization and as far as booksellers have been creative about it. Uh, it has been categorized variously as philosophy, maybe uh, psychology you've mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, so booksellers, please uh, be courteous and aware when you're shopping books. <laughs> uh, although that's how we find a new audience. Um, for my part, look, I remember, yeah, getting five pages in and 
knowing and having that physical sense that this was a book that I was going to have to devote some time to and and with pleasure devote some time to. So thank you so much for that experience and and for creating something that I think rewards multiple readings and that uh, conveys such a sense of history. It, it sounds like it had a long gestation, this book. Um, what was it in terms of the, the initial sense that you had that uh, something like no document would form? When, when was that? Oh, gosh, um, that's a good question. Um, and I should also say, um, as we're beginning here, that uh, I, I am uh, on Gadigal country and uh, right near Wongal country as well, unceded Wongal and Gadigal country um, where I live. Um, where did it begin? I mean, I think um, I think around uh, 2016, um, I I thought I was going to write another book, a different, a very different book altogether about um, music. Uh, you know, and a, a lot of people here will know that I, I've written a lot of music criticism, um, and that. That idea kind of, I don't know, it just kind of fell through my fingers quite quickly. And I was in the States um, doing some research on what was ostensibly meant to be that book. Um, and I went to the Guggenheim um, where I'd been before because I lived, I did my master's degree in New York. So, you know, New York was a familiar place to me. Um, but, you know, you don't get used to those kind of big <laughs> temples of Western art. Um, so there I was at the Guggenheim and it was, it was actually, uh, it, this was actually, it was, it was um, 2017. It was early 2017. So um, of course it was, and it was about two weeks after Trump's inauguration. So there was a certain mood in the air, particularly in a, in a very uh, Democrat city like New York. Um, and yeah, I went to the Guggenheim and for the first time in, I don't know, it was something like 50 years, they had their founding collection on show, like, you know, the paintings that, that the gallery originally um, had when it opened. Um, and those were all, of course, European modernists. And so they had three or four um, Franz Marc paintings on show. And he's an artist I'd always loved um, and it had kind of been in the back of my mind for a long time to try writing about him. In fact, when I was doing my master's in poetry, I wrote a fairly unsuccessful poem about his work. <laughs> um, uh, and so, so th this has kind of been germinating. And, and then I saw these paintings and of course, you know, as a lot of people who live um, uh, in the Southern hemisphere, we might say, will have experienced, you don't, you know, you, you come at all this kind of canonical European work and it's often at a at a far remove, like you've only seen it in books, you know. So so I finally saw some of these paintings actually on the wall in person. Um, yeah, and that really just got me thinking, I, ha I have to kind of keep pursuing this, you know, I have to because I was just so mesmerised by seeing them in person um, on the wall in front of me and... Yeah, so I mean, in a sense, the book was a, is is a kind of object lesson in um, what it means to kind of follow your instincts and follow your obsessions. Because I, that that in a sense was where it started. It's like I have to go back to this Franz Mark thing, and I have to think about this painting, this particular painting, um, Tishik Sale in the German, uh, the Fate of the Animals, um, um, which was one of his last major paintings before he went to war. Um, and yeah, in a sense, that that was that was the germination of it. And and then I started researching his life, and I kind of started to realize that there were ways in which I could. I mean, because obviously I knew of his interest in animals, you know, and things like that. But I started when I started researching his life and realizing that it had. You know, obviously, he was a founding member of the Blue Rider, the, the the Blue Rider movement. And when I started thinking about this sense of collaboration, I realized 
that I could bring my own history into it, you know. I mean, I, th I think... I think in another sense I knew that I had to write that history at some point. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, it had, I had to do it. Um, but, yeah, but it was that sense of, oh, wait a minute, I can bring these things together. Mm. And I wasn't, I wasn't sure how. I, you know, I didn't really know. The, the, writing the book was an experiment in how to, you know, in figuring out how to bring them together. Um, I yeah. wondered if the... The response to to art is part of your process of how you come at things because as you say there is two sides to the book there is the story of your friend ned uh seville if i'm pronouncing mm -hmm. it, ned seville and and then um the interweaving of various voices um in terms of histories artists um and i wondered because you've written criticism uh, and made zines and often these are ways of coming at something uh, whether personal or whether it's another artistic object through, um, through one other artistic object is that part of your process using the uh, an artistic object like Franz Mark the artist in this case is a, a place to start from yeah for sure yeah absolutely I mean I think I think um, in that sense um, Criticism is very instinctive for me. I'm not sure, I, you know, I, and I'd be interested to know if that's the case for you as well as, as a critic. I mean, I just, I feel like that's the way I think, you know, I think I think through um, artworks. And I mean, even in high school, you know, I was a very enthusiastic student of art history and of modern art history in particular. Um, and I kind of, re I remember, I remember quite clearly having this kind of epiphany in, in late high school because I was, on the one hand, I was studying modern history and on the other hand, I was studying modernism in art history. And it, it, it dawned on me at a certain point that history per se made much more sense to me and was much more kind of vivid and visceral to me when I could think about it through the framework of what people made, you know, the kind of date, the kind of, you know, re recitation of dates and, um, battle names and stuff like that in modern history um never um never kind of brought the past to me in the way that thinking about artistic creation and artistic production does yeah so very much i i think i you know i i, I very much think think through um those kind of things through artworks and through artists and so even though this is i mean you know, it's not in a strict sense a book of criticism. Um, I'm not sure I could have written it without having been a critic, you know, or having having that kind of mind where I, you know, I'm always interested in responding to um, to artworks and to artists um, across different art forms, you know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, for myself as a critic, what I took from it is this idea of collaboration, which I'm very <laughs> curious about. We often have the idea of both the critic and the writer as the single um, godlike consciousness manipulating the characters across the stage, or in the case of criticism, manipulating uh, opinions and um, references and kind of the weight of authority on the page as a single person as opposed to mm -hmm. many people. And I mean, I'm very curious about your experience as a person, as an, as an artist. Because one thing I've struggled with um, as a person, but also as an artist, as a critic, is uh, abstraction. I tend to be abstract. And uh, I know we're both Talking Heads fans, and for a long time I was interested in people like David Byrne, who to me, I thought there was so much pathos in their work, but I was aware that they struggled with being perceived as cold or overly abstract. And, oh, okay. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. to be frank, I sense that in your own work. Um, I think it is a, an approach that the person can't necessarily, like a fish in water, can't necessarily help. I know I've disappeared. Um, <laughs> okay, you come um, back. Come back. <laughs> back. Um, I wonder if I can make that a kind of object lesson. You know, I, I do think that there is joy in the idea of the person disappearing, but people can also perceive that as being cold or abstract. And I wonder. <laughs> You struggle with that in the reception to your all. 
I mean, cold is cold is an interesting word, um, mm. isn't it? It's it's it, when we use it about tone. You know, when we say that the tone of something is cold, we we don't tend to mean that as a compliment. Um, but I know for myself that I similarly, certainly when it comes to music, you know, I've always been um, very attracted to things with that tonal quality to them. You know, I I like things that are cold, um, cold. Um, mm. And I mean, I don't, I don't think of this book that I wrote as, I don't think of it as cold, but I, I think I can perceive how some people might, you know, and for those, you know, in, ca in case there are people here who haven't read it and they're like, what the fuck are they talking about? Um, you know, the, the book is I get, at heart, it's, you know, it's an elegy for a very dear friend of mine who I went to art school with and um, we, collaborated together for several years but it's about a lot of other things as well um and it's also in a sense a, a a book in which i tried to reckon with um particular events in australian history and particular kind of periods of activism that i was involved in and that we were involved in you know and for for, for us and for me um collaboration has always been a kind of consciously political choice you know um I mean I think I came I came to the notion of collaboration as a as a as a music fan you know and 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 of course bands the sense of a band as a kind of gang you know as a collection of people who come together voluntarily to do something and you know I was always entranced by that and still am to a large degree um but I could never, you know, being a girl, being a girl, there weren't many people around, certainly not in the 90s, who, um, when I was a teenager, you know, I would kind of ask around, but um, it was hard to find, it was hard to find anyone who wanted to be in a band with me, so. <laughs> How would young women who look back, maybe nostalgically at that time, feel about that, though? Because on one perspective, of course, you're a massive fan of Hole, um, yeah. you know, fronted, of course, by Courtney Love. And yeah. there were so many um, famous female fronted or all female um, bands in the alternative scenes, at least mm. in the 90s. Um, so, but you're saying it wasn't like that for you on the ground? Not at Penrith High, no, it wasn't. Not at Penrith High. Um, no, um, no. Anyway, so collaboration, right? Yes, that's that's partly where it came from. But, you know, then also as a teenager, I was, yeah, starting to read zines and read kind of, um, yeah, like radical theory and stuff like that. And I kind of, again, through pop music, kind of discovered the work of the Situationist International when I was about 16, 17, which just like turned my life upside down. And, and again, it's that notion of the collective. And again, you know, modernist history, art history is full of, um, full of collective efforts. Um, yeah, so that was part of it. But to go, I realised I kind of sidetracked there talking about collaboration because we were talking about co coldness, right? So the, this book is an elegy for a collaborative friendship and a collaborative partnership. Um, and I, I wanted, I mean, I wanted it to be controlled, you know, insofar as, especially given that, 10 years have passed, you know, my friend Ned died at the end of 2010. Um, and I guess I started writing this book in earnest in about 2017. Yeah, 2017. So, you know, it had been seven years by that point, which in some ways is not a very long amount of time. And, you know, bereavement is one of those things that, again, makes time feel meaningless. You know, things can feel like yesterday or they can feel like a century ago. Um, but it would have, I mean, I knew very well that it would have been entirely disingenuous of me to write something that was like raw, raw, quote unquote, you know, that was like, because it's it, enough time had passed that um, I needed and I wanted to uh, write about that material in a, um, in a, in a, in a, in a controlled way, you know, um, so, yeah, I can understand why, you know, and I mean, I could talk for a million years about the way that kind of, you know, and I think I did talk in my book about whole about the way in which kind of gender is very bound up with our 
reception as audiences in what we perceive as kind of raw or kind of unfiltered and what we perceive as being controlled. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was a particular, like, there's a particular sentence very early in the book. I think it's on the first page, actually. I'll find it. Um, um, where is it? Oh, here we go. It's like the fifth sentence of the book. Um, or the, the fifth stanza, shall we say. Um, I was young for a long time. Nobody died. Perhaps I wanted to die or thought that I did, but that is not the same. And that 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 little bit that that was one of those kind of cliche writer moments where it kind of it, you know it came to me like I was kind of I was I was just, I remember I was kind of three quarters asleep it was late at night and it just kind of landed in my mind and this was at an early point in the gestation of the book you know and I sat bolt upright and kind of typed it into my phone and I knew I knew that that like when I found that that I'd found the tone of the book like that was mm. like hearing a bell, you know, being struck. It was like, yes, that's the that is the root mm -hmm. note of the book. Is that tone? Mm. Um, yeah, finding the tone determines so so much. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting when you say it came to you early in the morning. Did you say? Or like very late at night? You know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I feel that those liminal times are when all the writing really happens. I always. I've learned to keep a notepad by my bed mm -hmm. because yeah, four a.m., five a.m. It's there. The review is written. The poem is done. Mm -hmm. The short story comes. <laughs> well, the worst, the worst thing is when you have a dream, like when you have a dream about something that you've written, like in your dream, you know. And it's amazing. It's like, oh my god, I love <laughs> this thing that I just wrote. And then you wake up and you're like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, you wrote Ulysses and it's gone now. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we need science to work on that one. That's we for do. sure. We do. Um, yeah. Is it true that this book was originally or tentatively titled Kindred? Yeah, that was a working title for a long time. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, and I love I, I love that word. Um, it's a very old, it's a very old word. Like if you look at the etymology of that word um, in English, you know, it goes back a long, 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 long way. Like it goes back to a kind of shared, you know, Indo-European root. You know, it's one of the oldest words in the language um, in terms of its etymology. Um, and obviously it's a word that can, um, that indicates kind of relationships across species as well, or it can do that, you know, the notion of kindred, of having uh, non-human animals that are kindred. Um, and then there's the notion of kindred spirit, which I've, you know, I've always really loved. Um, and um, yeah, partly because, for me, the notion of the kindred spirit is is multiple. You know, um, I've never really, um, I've never particularly liked terms like soulmate or whatever. They, um, I, I, th I think, partly because they imply that there's only one. There's this kind of harking back to the to the kind of ancient Platonic myth of kind of you know two two halves that need to be joined. But to me, the idea of a of a kindred spirit um can be can be multiple you know and, and i feel fortunate in my very fortunate in my life to to have found um more than one kindred spirit you know but but ned ned was certainly one of them he, he was he was a kindred spirit so um yeah so so but there there are just there are a few books called kindred including of course most famously octavia butler's um book so yeah um, Another hard one, yeah. Not only just one, but Ulysses, they take your good title. <laughs> but I think it, I mean, it actually took a long time. It took a long time to get to no document as a title, but I think it's the right mm. title, you know. It, it, mm. yeah. um, I think it's the right title for the book. But but certainly the notion of kindred relationships is is very um, core to the book. And, and again, that sense of, and I certainly found this as I was, you know, the more that I kind of researched Franz Marc and even though he was an artist that I had loved for a long time, I feel like I've never done that kind of deeper dive on an artist before and kind of, you know, looked at everything that I could. And I encountered many language barriers along the way and cursed myself for not learning German when I was an undergraduate <laughs> because there's a lot that's untranslated to this day. 
Um, but um, but yeah, but but that that sense of that sense of kind of doing enough research into a person's life that you kind of feel as if you can start to imagine, you know, imagine what that was and and a sense of its texture and and that and I found that kind of so moving and you know in in I think it was in 2017 I I did go to Germany um and I kind of went around to all the major galleries there that have his work and have the work of the German expressionists and I went to visit his grave um you know he's he's buried with his um wife Maria who survived him by several decades um she didn't she died in the late 1950s from memory and obviously he died in the first world war and they were both artists and again you know this this sense of kind of a partnership um so I was going somewhere with that oh yes that's right the sense of kindred right the sense mm -hmm. the sense that you have um I don't know, like companions across time, you know, and that you might be separated from them by several centuries, but you have some instinct that that you understand them and that they would have understood you, that they would mm -hmm. have rec recognised you maybe. <laughs> yeah. It's funny in the context of language because often that's how it, the, the realisation comes across when we think, oh, maybe I am German or maybe mm -hmm. I am Peruvian, mm -hmm. but I just... Um, and you may or may not learn the language. I know some writers um, who are multilingual have that sense that they're mm. coming home to maybe a, a truer language. Mm, mm, mm. And the and idea. So, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, even though I am monolingual, um, there are nevertheless, you know, things in the book that are untranslated. Like I did use German, I did use French. Um, uh, yeah partly partly for the for the texture you know just because even though I don't speak the language as someone as someone who's interested in language and as someone who's interested in its valences and its sonics and its textures there was something about um using untranslated terms that really mattered to me like you know another work that threads its way through the book which is also has a lot to do with animals is uh Georges Franju's Le Sang de Bête, uh his documentary about um abattoirs that was made just after the second world war in um Paris on the outskirts of Paris um and you know the book begins with that and ends with that really um you know it goes all the way through the book um and again I think I never use uh, you know the English translation of that film's title is the the blood of the beasts which is fine I mean that's a kind of literal translation but um, there's something about the French title, um, Le Sang de Bête, and the fact that sang, blood, you know, this is where we get our word, obviously, exsanguination from, you know, that there are these kind of etymological ghosts because English is such a mongrel language um, that that you get the ghosts of other languages in English. And I, I kind of wanted to maintain that sense, you know, in the book. Mm. No, it's something I always encourage writers to think about is you shouldn't just use a word without a sense of the valence and the sonics and the mm. etymology if mm. possible. Um, it does kind of cling to the word and it changes the, the writing you're doing. Mm. I wonder, you mentioned, uh, you, you know, you began in zines and you mentioned that as one of the origins of your artistic consciousness, I guess. Mm. And and an interest in music. And I wonder, you know, writing is a famously solitary profession. How you reconcile this desire for collaboration to be amongst mm. the world and people with being a writer. Yeah, I mean, I think that's partly why I maintain a practice in visual art that is collaborative to this day, because if, yeah, writing, um, Writing can be very lonely. That's that said, I have done collaborative writing, you know, mm -hmm. which I I really love. And Ned and I used to write together. It was one of it was part of our practice, you know, was to write together. We used to write our um, essays together and stuff like that at art school and kind of submit them jointly. And um, we wrote each other letters, and some of those kind of become part of the book. I mean, in a in a specific sense, when I was writing this book, um, I felt very strongly that it was 
and is our kind of our final collaboration you know it was the only it was the only way that i had because he died young um uh you know and he, he he was he was someone who had cystic fibrosis which is a serious illness and you know most people with cystic fibrosis do die young um nevertheless he also ended up getting cancer on top of that which was very unexpected and that meant that his death was very sudden and very you know shocking to everyone who knew him um so because of that because it was a sense of something you know that had just kind of been like cut off um and never kind of came as a collaboration to to its natural end and it may have had an end you know i mean that's the thing about collaborations it's not all of them last forever but while they last you know it's 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 that that energy is so unique and it, and it was a, it was a very and remains a kind of very particular aspect of of grief to have lost that that specific thing like not just a friendship but to have lost that that collaborative relationship um so i felt yeah i kind of knew i knew that i knew that i had to end it you know i had I, ha I had to bring our collaboration to an end somehow you know uh and the writing this book was the only way to do it but in a sense it was you know i i did feel i did feel that it that, that we were doing it together even if that sense is only in my own mind you know it was nevertheless very um very real to me and in fact became more real after I'd finished when I finished the book, which was almost a year ago to this day. I just realized downstairs before before this started, I was like pouring myself a whiskey and I was like, wait a minute, this whiskey was bought for me last year. I made my mum buy me this top shelf whiskey when I finished the revisions of on the manuscript, which was the day before my birthday last year. Um, uh, and yeah and my birthday's next week so it's like it's exactly. yeah it's, it's almost it's almost a year ago uh exactly that i've that i've finished finished um and when yeah when i finished it there was a genuine kind of sense of loss like it made me realize how intense this communion with with someone had been even though they're gone um that um and i talk you know i talk to them all the time in my head anyway this 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 very intensive period of um imaginative discourse and collaboration that's the only word i have for it had kind mm -hmm. of come to an end um which was necessary, I think, for, for me. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, uh, it was something I had to do. But yeah, yeah. I, I remember reviewing Paige Clark, who has a new short story collection out, that um, I talked about granting the writer their obsessions. Mm. Um, it comforts me as a writer, the idea that we have obsessions, because in that sense, they're never lost. So we published the book, but in having that document, mm. um, and as you say, this book has a lot of net in it. There's the letters you exchange, as you mentioned. There's recounting the times you would um, put banners up and or erect sort of, I'm not sure if it was activism or art or both. Both. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of <clears throat> that second life is always there mm. as a writer. And I remember when I wasn't writing that, it was only after I began writing again that I had this sense of what I'd lost. I'd lost my second life. Mm, mm, yeah. I'm curious. I was watching Kathy Park Hong, Maggie Nelson today, and the ecology came up. The idea that Kathy Park Hong sometimes has to tell her students, although the world's ending, we can still write poetry or mm. not. Um, or that's not. What the students are saying, why bother? And you've talked about uh, an interest in not just human relations. And in the book, there is that um, uh, a constant reference to the relationships with all animals. Mm. Tell me about that. You're, tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, um, 
G yeah, give, give, given given that two of two of the artworks and artists that I was responding to most strongly in the book, um, Franz Marc, uh, you know, who painted animals almost exclusively, and um, Georges Franju's um, abattoir documentary, uh, you, you know, thinking about animals and writing about our relationship with animals was was um, unavoidable. I think. I think for me, the uh, without you know turning this into a discourse on animal animal rights, um, why not? No, why not? Um, you know the again, you know uh, abattoirs and the function of abattoirs and the existence of abattoirs is something that I'd been thinking about for a really long time, um, a really long time, you know, and that um, film was a part of it, although you know I'd, I'd been vegetarian vegan in fact before i saw that documentary um but um what am i trying to say uh, i want i wanted i i wanted to think fairly specifically about the way in which uh abattoirs and i guess industrial farming specifically you know the agribusiness kind of industry has is a kind of structural one of the structural violences that 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 um defines and and our society that that structures it you know it's a violence that structures the society that we live in is 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 this particular kind of um violence uh towards animals uh and and the fact that um the fact that farmed factory farmed animals um are really there's there's a sense in which they they exist only to die you know that they're a surplus population you know they that they that they the existence of um of factory and of factory farmed animals um, is their their purpose is fulfilled in in their in their death, you know, and that there's something so uh, horrific, you know, existentially I find just profoundly um, terrible about that fact about the fact that so many animals are bred by humans to, to die, to, to not actually have any agency uh, in, in their lives, but, um, but to, to fulfill their purpose in being killed. Um, and obviously from there, you know, uh, in terms of thinking about what it means for, for a living being to be considered as a kind of surplus, um, and what it means for their death or deaths to be unacknowledged uh, and unregarded and for their lives to also be unacknowledged and unregarded. Um, there are then all kinds of ways in which you may also think about, um, you know, the resonances with uh, human beings, you know, and the way in which uh, human beings can also be similarly disregarded uh yeah yeah mm. so that's that's definitely that's that's part of it um and then of course in the process of writing the book i mean over the three or four years that i wrote it um you know the 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 in particular, the, the 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 bushfires happened. You know, the, the the last that horrific set of bushfires in late 2019, early 2020, which was just as I was kind of yeah finishing finishing the initial kind of um, manuscript. And and I mean, there's 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 only I think there's a passing there's a kind of pa passing reference to it in the book, but I. I felt it necessary to kind of mark that, you know, there, there are, there are certain points in the book where I kind of, it was almost like breaking the fourth wall where I kind of wanted to mark 
things that were happening as I was writing it, and that was one of mm -hmm. them, you know. Um, uh, yeah, to, to, to kind of not, to not um, pretend that the writing of the book, that the production of the work was kind of happening outside of time, you know, in some kind of vacuum. Um, yeah, and I think to... I think too that it's part of the reason why, you know, there's a refrain that goes through the book and maybe I can find a page that has one of these refrains on it, but there's a refrain that runs through the book about like things that are above my desk, you know, um, and I'm, and that's, I mean, I'm a very visual person, obviously, you know, being a visual artist, I think very visually and this book is very much, it's a, it has a, it has a kind of visual logic to it. Um, and in a sense, a lot of my inspiration came from cinema and came from thinking about the kind of logic and the rhythms of film editing, you know, and the way in which you can juxtapose images with each other. Um, but I kind of, I, you know, I wrote one of these refrains and then I started to include more. And there was something I really liked about um, just a that part of the function of that refrain for me of kind of above my desk is such and such and then I would describe an image, a postcard or an image or something, that part of the function of that for me became um, recalling myself and maybe the reader to the kind of, to the actual kind of frame of production, you know, the fact that he, here I am sitting at my desk doing this thing and, and these are the things that are around me. You know, I'm a real person in a real in a real room. <laughs> this very room, in fact. Um, yeah. Friends right behind you. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a little postcard. Postcard of, well, one of the things I talk about in the book, which is um, his tower, Tower of Blue Horses. Um, yeah. So. I'm curious about the real person behind the work. <laughs> and. I'm curious because you've recently ended a stint, I think it was around 10 years as the monthly music critic. Eight years, yeah. Eight years. Oh, God, eight. 10. That would have, yeah. Eight, eight's long enough, yeah. Eight years. Mm. And you've mentioned the idea of uh, many writers beginning with zines or in uh, writing about music mm -hmm. and potentially ageing out of, the ability to write about music, although I don't think it's confined to music. I think all writers fear the sense of losing touch with the zeitgeist as we age, it's, uh, it happens. And I'm curious then to ask, do you worry about aging out of politics? I turn 40 next week, okay? This question is like, <laughs> this is a personal attack. <laughs> I don't mean it as such. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm quoting I'm quoting Amon Crawford's interview. Um, the real Amon Crawford. Um, so, but yeah, so I'm curious about this, whether it is, um, yeah, a feeling of, and oh, because you did begin in, in in zines and music writing, and you know that question of the connection to the zeitgeist or um, or you know the cliche that we age out of militancy and politics and things like that. Mm -mm. I mean. I still I still make scenes that you know and I think that's that's important to kind of say it's not just something that I began in you know it's something that I still uh, actively uh, participate in and that's very uh, meaningful to me um, and you know really as I wrote this book I, I, I I mean, I knew I knew that it wasn't going to be a zine in the sense that it would have a different kind of circulation and a different production mode to a zine. Nevertheless, its actual creation for me was very, uh, you know, I often asked myself as I was writing it, it's, you know, if this was a zine, what would I do next? You know, what would be on the next page? And, and certainly that sense of um, conceptualising things, you know, for me, for me, the kind of, and again, this this I mean, this partly comes from zines. It partly comes from poetry. It partly comes from visual art. Like um, conceiving of how it was going to be visually and 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 its kind of layout, you know, was was part that was part of the writing process. You know, that there was a lot of kind of um, moving things around, um, either on screen or kind of printing things out and literally kind of cutting and pasting them with scissors, like I still do with zines. 
Um, so, you know, and I know, I mean, um, mo most, most, of, most of my own friends, old friends um, who make scenes are, are a similar age to me, you know, I, which isn't to say there aren't young zine, zine makers, there are, but it's just, you know, um, yeah, it's, I, I guess I'm just trying to make the point that zines aren't just like a young, like a young person's thing, you know, I'm, I'm, I, and that's kind of part of what's beautiful about them. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I know, and I remember thinking about this when I was writing my um, book on Hull, uh, the, my monograph on Live Through This, um, because that was written almost 20 years after the fact of that record, you know, um, and I, I know for myself as a critic and as a thinker and as a writer that I I am much better I'm I'm I I I write for me what's much what's much more kind of worthwhile work a kind of a long way after the fact you know like time time is a part of the process um so in that sense, I don't really give a shit and have never really cared about, well, am I in touch with what's going on? Because I know very well that I, I yeah, that I, I write best about things that I've been thinking about for a long time, you know, not just six months, but like 20 years, you know, things that I've been thinking about for 20 years are the things that I write about mm. the best, you know. Mm. Um, well, um, there's a tighter politics there, right? Because you've talked about, artists ability to unionize and the mm. uh fickleness of freelancing it's it's worse now than it was you know in any previous time period really we want to point to um and so i wonder if there's a correlation there where we can say well it's okay for me to talk about the music the kids aren't listening to right now necessarily um because everyone you know we're all getting older and we're all I, i'm just very fascinated by the fickleness and and your participation or, or lack thereof in the churn of the publishing industry the fact you tend to prefer not to use you know a profile shot to mm -hmm. have a camera and um and to maintain that integrity you know when i talk about zines of course i'm saying it's where people often start not where they only start or mm -hmm. um yeah, do, do, do you think about maybe the interconnections between all of those things, the ability for artists to have the confidence of their obsessions mm. um, in a context where financially and in terms of the industry that's discouraged maybe more than ever? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think in part that's one thing that that zines maybe have, have given me and the zine community, you know, and, you know, I've... I've Community is one of those work. Community is one of those words. I've always been very suspicious of, but but um, the zine, the zine community, uh, when I speak of that, is one of the few communities in that sense that I find to be to be real. You know, like I, that word is meaningful uh, in the sense of talking about a zine community. And 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 one of the things that 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 milieu I think has has given me kind of right from the start when I was a teenager uh, is is and still gives me is that sense of well yes you can you can just seize your well a you seize them seize the means of production comrades um but also you you know seize seize your um seize hold of your obsessions and your preoccupations and 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 go with them you know there is there is kind of nothing there is nothing to you know, outre that it that it can't be of interest to somebody, um, and and as I have I think said to to writing students that I've taught, you know, like, um, I mean, there's 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 nothing worse than trying to kind of second guess a readership and 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 thinking to yourself, well, well, I'd better not write about this because you know X, Y, or Z abstract readership might not like it. Um, my strong feeling is that if you follow the things that you genuinely care about and are genuinely preoccupied by, you know, um, that 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 is enough. You know, the energy the energy of your preoccupations will kind of come through on the page, and whether other people know 
specifically what you're talking about or have ever heard of it before that is kind of beside the point you know I mean I didn't worry myself when I was writing a document about whether anyone else would know or care about the particular constellation of obsessions and and experiences that make it up my conviction was that if I did it well enough <laughs> that other people would care because because it was you know because it was it, it yeah it had integrity I mean to use that word it had in it, you know that it that if it had enough integrity as as an artwork in itself that people would come to it and that people would respond to it um you know whether or not those particular preoccupations were theirs or not you know mm. um and I you know for for me that's kind of been bought, borne out in so far as you know I've had people respond to it really um passionately and really in a really genuine way um in a in a in a way you know and and I mean people may know that I kind of put I put the kind of PO box address in the back of the book that <laughs> that I've shared a PO box, um, Sydney's least exclusive postal address, as it's often referred to, a PO box that's been shared around throughout the kind of zine and anarchist network in Sydney for uh, more than two decades now. Um, uh, but yes, but there is a PO box address, PO box for Enmore, New South Wales 2042, Australia, send me mail. Um, <laughs> And I have had mail, um, but yeah, yeah but pe people people's response to the book has been along the lines of kind of what it is sometimes when you read a good scene, which I find really incredible. You know, I, I, I my friend my friend Vanessa Berry, who may be here this evening, um, you know, who is also a, 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 a hugely experienced scene maker, she said something great uh, a little while back when she was doing her own launch for her book, um, Gentle and Fierce, um, about how, you know, there's a sense when you, there can be, that there's a real sense when you write a zine that you're kind of um, writing to a friend, you know, whether you know that, whether you actually know that person or not, that you are writing, you are writing for a community, you know, and that, um, I, I I really kind of kept that close to my heart when I was writing the document, and I think it it resonates with me in two senses. There was the sense that I I kind of you know I, I had the I had the belief that I was writing to friends, kind of unknown, you know, people who would read it, who would who would find something in it that they cared for, but also I was writing it to a friend in the sense that I was writing it very. Um, specifically you know to the person that it's dedicated to you know so i was i was writing it to a friend you it, know. it's a lovely thing and <laughs> you're right it's been borne out both in terms of the, uh, the success of the book i see vanessa berry has sent a flower digital flower <laughs> away. Ah uh, yes, and 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 my dear friend Emma, who is a keeper of the PO box, uh, Sydney's least exclusive zine address. Yes, that is the correct that is the correct appellation for PO box for. <laughs> the unknown friends is true because when I had my experience of reading your book at the gym, to be honest, confession time, I literally, I don't think I'd ever read you before. I literally basically had no idea who you were. Good. Well, no one does so. <laughs> In, in in the most genuinely testable sense. So I was enraptured by the book on the basis of uh, of no prior knowledge. And, you know, as you say, the courage of your convictions, I was astounded to learn that things like Jonathan Coe's What a Carve Up had influenced this book because that was a, uh, I don't know how to describe it, a book that changed my life a little bit. Mm. I really could not believe after I'd read it that such a, amazing book existed and to think that years later you know that was maybe 10 years ago for me i'd uh meet Alan crawford author of the document who'd have that in her book and and you know the zines i myself grew up you know in high school there was iraq war i remember getting into ballard and research and kathy acker mm -hmm. yeah uh, research being research search the sort of zine community yeah and yeah. yeah so these things do have an afterlife they do, yeah, absolutely. And I think that notion of afterlife, I mean, 
you know, that maybe that's a bit on the nose given we're talking about an elegy, but nevertheless, the, 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 the notion of an artistic afterlife and, a, and, and an afterlife in collective memory um, is kind of so important to me, you know, and, and in, ter in terms of in a political sense to, you know, that sense of wanting to consider how certain things are remembered, you know, collectively or how they're forgotten. Um, it was so important. Um, I can see all my rat bag anarchist friends in the chat talking about, the, talking about the PO box. <laughs> <laughs> And we, we may have time for questions from rat bags and everyone. Um, I, I'm not sure how much time we have for questions. Um, I do know there was one quick one about what whiskey you were drinking. Oh, easy one. Lafroig. Like, uh, mm, proper, mm. proper Irish whiskey. Um, should I? Should I? Should I read? Should I read something? Should I would I love something? you to read. Yeah. Why you, not? Is there something you would like me to read, Declan? I can. I can take. Requests. Oh wow! <laughs> I did consider whether I, whether I wanted to ask for something specific. I remember there was a part where you mentioned being in Manhattan. I'm just looking. Oh for yeah. It. Oh yeah. That was I, when, I, when yeah. I arrived in New York. I enjoyed you? that. I know. You can see how well prepared we are here. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh yeah it's that thing if i'll find i'll find it any minute but i won't um if we don't i've got notes here so i can find oh maybe oh i think i think i found it mm -hmm. i found I, I certainly found a a bit about new york i trust the whole book is a masterpiece so <laughs> All right. Well, for anyone following along at home, this is uh, this is page eighty-six that I'm gonna I'm gonna read. Um, okay. Um, I didn't tell you that I'm allowed to go to some far distant places, but not you. You write to me, but never send before I leave for New York. You and your life's love had already gone to give your country. Arriving in New York, I felt a technicolor unreality. A yellow cab swept me across what must have been the Queensborough Bridge and it was August and sunshine delineated everything a little too brightly, but different to the bottom of the world glare I knew. This light had ambition, I was sure, as it picked up the edges of the brick apartment blocks parked by the East River and the river's moat and Art Deco buildings glinting silver as nickels in the sun, in that sun. Even the cab I was in felt haloed by an extra yellowness. It was jet lag and arriving on the lands of the Lenape as far away from what I knew as I could never guess I'd get. A windfall, material and sudden, maybe also spiritual, if this isn't too gauche a word and even if it is, the scholarship girl's condition is to know her luck and to fail to conceal it. Seriously, what about our plan to take over the world? I love that refrain. <laughs> what about our plan to take over the world? Indeed. I'm Still stepping in. Just stepping in to take over the chat. <laughs> no, we're taking over the world. <laughs> That's right. This is the this is the the, the, uh, the long arm of the police coming in to uh, stop oh, yeah, things from getting out of hand. Features in at least one police report. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, it doesn't look like there's any questions there, so I thought that I would uh, come come in and uh, I mean, but besides besides the very important question about whiskey recommendations, it's, it looks yeah. like that might be it for the friends. evening. So I thought I would step in and uh, wind things up there. So thank you so much, Declan, for your really great leading of this conversation and your you know your reading of the book and your really sharp and kind of empathetic reading of Anne, of Anwen's work, both in the review and talking to her tonight. It's 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 wonderful to see the two of you in discussion. Um, and thank you, Anwen, of course, for exactly. the wonderful No Document, which uh, I should say, uh, as the uh, representative of the publisher, is available in any good bookshop that's currently open in Australia, of which there are a few, and, uh, of, and also through through Jeremondo's website as well. So please do buy four or five or six copies 
for friends and family. Um, just a bit of housekeeping is that this uh, recording, this uh, session is recorded, so you'll be able to access it and share it with friends through uh, through Crowdcast, and we'll make it available um, in other ways through our platforms as well in the future through YouTube soon. So, um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. It's a really great evening, and it's great to see so many people here, both anarchists, zine makers, and uh, and and others as well. Um, my people, my people. My people. <laughs> so, unless you have any last words, Anwen, I will hit the end button. I'm all good. I'm all good. Okay. I'm going to go and drink my whiskey. Finish now. your whiskey. Thank you, Jacqueline. Right. Thank you, Nick. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You, Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> have a good night. Bye.